hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. Um, today, we have a guest of Matt Johnson of Bear Conductive, uh, purveyor of electric paint pens and the touchboard. <clears throat> and uh, we're hoping for a freewheeling discussion, which we often have, of the relationship between technology and design in the Arduino world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the creation of distributed interfaces on unexpected materials not normally seen as technological, such as wood, paper, and cardboard. We had a little bit of that when we talked about Makey Makey a couple of weeks ago. So, um, folks, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, and then, Matt, you can take it away. Don't forget to unmute your microphone when you talk and remute it when you're, you're done talking. So, Ken, why don't we start with you? Okay, I'm 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 a, um, I'm a, I guess I'm a regular on Howard Geek House. They're 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 wonderfully instructive, and I've met some great people here. Um, and I'm an old school hacker, you know. Um, just to, so um, that's what I like, and I'm always interested in new technologies and new ways to hack. Michelle. My name is Michelle Cordy. I teach a grade three and four class, and um, I'm a wannabe hacker. Um, I try to hack my classroom space, and um, I'm looking to try to understand Arduino um, for my own fun, but then find ways to bring it to the classroom. So I'm right currently playing with um, So Electric and getting my feet wet with the lily pad, and I have an Arduino. I can make an LED light up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Well, you got started. Terry? Hi, Howard. Um, Terry Smith. I'm um, from Canada. Uh, I work in the IT industry. Um, my interest is in wearables, primarily. Um, I would consider myself a novice at the moment to Arduino, um, but uh, enjoying the, the geek outs very much. Okay, take it away, Matt. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> sorry, I have to clear my throat there. Um, well, hi, everybody. It's very nice to meet you all. Um, I think that actually <clears throat> this is probably a, uh, a range of people which is somewhat indicative of the range of people that we normally speak to. And I was talking to somebody today saying that one of the things that we try really hard is to make sure that we attract everything from everyone from kids uh, to the most technical engineers right and that's new school hackers to old school hackers and I, I think it's really important for us to always be seen as accessible and credible to all those audiences so it sounds like this is the perfect uh, audience to, to speak to um, so <clears throat> Howard said give a brief introduction and I thought that um, I will attempt to share my screen with you here, and hopefully uh, you'll see it in a second. Um, just one moment. Let's see. I have to remember how to do it. Uh, just a sec. Give me one minute here. Screen share. Okay. Just a sec. Screen share. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, I'm hoping that you're seeing my keynote now. Um, we are. Okay, good, good. So <clears throat> I will not bore you with all of this. I thought I'd, I'd run through it. So there's a couple spots where I might just skip over something quite quickly. Um, but, you know, if you have a question, stop me, or we can always go back. But I just wanted to introduce everything that we do as a platform. And even when we were students, and that's where this whole company came from, we always saw it as a platform for other people to build what they wanted to build. So what do we make? We make this stuff. It's an electrically conductive paint. Um, as that sounds, it is literally a paint that conducts electricity. So there are other conductive paints and inks on the market, um, and there have been for a really long time. Ours has some unique properties that we take advantage of. Uh, to be more specific, it's conductive, it's non-toxic, dries at room temperature, 
can be applied in lots of ways. Uh, you can paint it, print it, um, spray it, whatever. It's low cost enough to play with, get messy with, and make mistakes. Uh, so we can power small devices. Uh, we can solder stuff. We can use it as a variable resistor. And importantly, we can use it as a capacitive sensor. So uh, there's the paint in a jar. There's the paint in a pen. Um, the foundation of this platform is really this idea of using it as uh, uh, using it as a conduit to power devices or to stick stuff together, to repair stuff. Um, a lot of people have been using it in e-textiles. Here it is with the Makey Makey. It's kind of a way to create a cool interface uh, with the Makey Makey, using it as a variable resistor. So this is all about kind of its electrical properties, or I should say exploiting its, its unique physical and electrical properties. I'm going to skip through this because it's kind of, this is usually when I talk about a product, but basically we have lots of fun kits that take these properties and do stuff with them, uh, like making flashing cards or making these little light-up houses. They're really fun, but I think that <clears throat> what I'd like to focus on is more about this kind of stuff, which is, okay, so what have other people done with the weird and unique properties of the material. One of the things we didn't expect was craftspeople saying, hey, we should use this on cardboard, or we should use this um, with uh, fabric, you know, essentially seeing it in the craft toolkit rather than the electronics toolkit. And, you know, we didn't expect that. People doing crazy things like making a liquid switch. So this is a, a syringe filled with the paint, and as you squeeze the syringe, it, you get this little liquid bridge between the end of the syringe and that copper wire, and then the LED lights up. Um, people have made tattoo guns with it. So if somebody's tattooing a piece of fruit here, it doesn't really make a great circuit, but it does work. It's quite cool. Um, <clears throat> people trying to make electronic components. So this is just a capacitor painted on a piece of paper. It, you know, Again, it doesn't work fabulously well, but it's certainly an exciting idea. Um, here's a capacitive sensor. So this is the idea of using it to create either a touch or a proximity sensor. Um, it's a pad of paint hooked up to an Arduino. It's a really simple thing to build, uh, but it feels really magical because this pad of paint is detecting you without you even touching it. So <clears throat> that is the same application, but here it's controlling a light, so you touch it, it turns the light on or off. Um, artists have used it. Kind of creative agencies have used the material to, to make things like these cool um, Christmas lights. Uh, people repair their trains with it. Um, music projects. Anyway, there's quite a lot of stuff that... Let's skip to the most important things here. Um, it's quite a lot of stuff that we find really exciting. This, in fact, I'll go a little bit further. This is where I think that maybe we can have the most fruitful discussion, but obviously I'm willing to talk about any of it which is this idea that with a material like ours, you can start to create interfaces that don't necessarily look electronic anymore. So here we've got a poster with an early version of our touch board hooked up to it, and depending on where you touch the poster, it plays different sounds, right? Um, very, very cool. Uh, and again, it's cool because it kind of plays on the poster uh, format, which everybody's familiar with, but it makes the poster a conduit or a, an access point for even more information. Um, this is a project by a company here in the UK called Uniform. Uh, they were trying to prototype new physical forms of music, and you know that's a, certainly a, an interesting and important question. And they said, well, what if these forms were somewhat more ephemeral? So they made these postcards in the foreground here, and they were all printed with our ink, or with our paint, rather, sorry. And they feel nice, but essentially they're just pieces of paper. <laughs> when you plug them into the machine, though, they become an interface for the music. So you touch the buttons, and it starts playing songs. Every postcard has a different set of songs associated with it. The, the clever thing and the kind of trick to this project was that if I gave the postcard to you and you played with the machine, you know, you might have this perception that somehow the postcard is storing the song or it is the song, it is the music, but in fact, it's not at all. It's just a piece of paper 
with a bit of conductive paint on it, and when connected to the machine, suddenly it allows you to access it. So um, what I thought was really clever about this is it gave interactivity to a huge range of people. I mean, I think they printed about 10,000 postcards um, for an event that this was debuted at, uh, which is crazy, but there was only a few boxes. So uh, it was a very clever way to give everyone access to the technology without putting a, a circuit board on every single postcard. So we st looked at all these projects and we eventually decided to uh, develop an Arduino based product which would allow these capacitive interactions to, to be essentially much easier to do. Um, this is just a shot of really early prototypes um, going from an Arduino to the touch board. So this is the touch board. The touch board essentially allows you to connect anything conductive to one of its 12 electrodes and turn it into either a button or into a proximity sensor. So it can get some pretty radical interactions on lots of different materials with this. Um, I think that's about, yeah, that's it, because my last one is our um, Kickstarter video, which nobody needs to see. I'm going to go back to unscreen sharing here uh, as soon as I can figure it out. Um, okay, hopefully I'm back. Um, I thought I'd also, <clears throat> let me get back to my chat. Um, I'm going to send you over the URL for the Kickstarter as well, because it might be interesting for people to see. But basically, that's what I wanted to set the stage with, which is that We've got this really broad platform of stuff um, that all has unique properties, and we're constantly trying to nurture a community around the materials and, and, and encourage people to exploit the properties in their own context, whether it's repairing model train sets, um, prototyping medical devices, or making interactive posters. Uh, so, Howard, if, it, you know, if you want me to talk about anything more, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to go into anything specific, or I'm happy to just start chatting. Well, we've got a few questions in the chat. Um, Great. I'll get back one to you question yeah. is, do, do you have URLs for your kits? Yes. Um, so, to the chat. I've got a, um, I just put the Kickstarter URL on, and I am about to put the URL up for that. So, there we go. Okay. Cool. So, I just put up our, it didn't look like it, it didn't take our other URL, so I'll try it again. There we go. So uh, I would en encourage uh, people to just jump in, turn on your your mic, and um, ask Matt uh, directly. Yeah, don't don't let me ha hug the microphone on this. So hi Matt, um, I'm I'm Ken. Like I said, I'm an old school hacker, but also yeah. I'm a I'm a f I'm the co-founder of the um, of those hackers, which is the um, hacking scout group associated with LA Makerspace. Cool. We did. We did, and I'll, I'll give you the link to our badge that we issue when you actually make a project with fair conductive paint. Oh wow! But, okay. <laughs> but but um, one of the things that we found with the younger kids in bare conductive paint was that hmm. you had to wait till it dried till it did anything. And yeah. and is that something you're addressing, or it was, that was so with the yeah. younger kids especially zero to wow is important. This was well, is it going to ever do it? It's broken. <laughs> oh, no, totally, totally. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, the the material, I should explain just to give everybody a bit more context, the material is water-based, so it it only works once the water has evaporated sufficiently for a, essentially a conductive network to, um, to, to be present, right? So the water moves, the water evaporates and all the conductive particles effectively touch each other and create a network. So that takes time, and you can speed it up to a certain extent by putting it under a lamp and you can slow it down a lot by blowing on it or by leaving it in a humid, uh, very humid environment. Um, so the answer to that is that uh, there are plans in the works for a new material which is significantly more sophisticated in terms of its material performance. Um, but with the current material, we usually uh, essentially schedule the way we make stuff very carefully and so that you don't have that moment where a bunch of kids, because it's usually kids, say, ah, it's not working, and then they get frustrated or distracted or bored. Um, and, but, but I realize that's not really a solution to a lot of 
uh, certainly not a solution if the events already occurred. Um, well, yeah, and, and but actually, that's sort of the solution like we came up with for our next event, which is <laughs> to start out with a bare conductive project, probably something night, something like like the houses we did last time. Yeah, um, we didn't buy your kits; we just bought components and made our own yeah. houses. But you know, you cool. can, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's no, great. No, it's um, great. It's great. But um, we. But you start with you put one of those together, and then you have some other things, maybe using what you know, conductive tape or something like that, so that they're occupied while the tape's drying. But I've also found yeah. just for adults, I'll take their business card, I'll shove a, a coin cell on one side, a paint, make bare conductive paint to it, and stick an LED and, and set it down <laughs> on the table. And while I'm talking to them, the LED yeah, yeah. comes on, right? So it's it's, it's effective in other places as well. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's a funny thing. It's like um, I, I think actually it's uh, – so I, I've got two projects I want to cite to that because I think that, it, yeah, in one way it's a, it's a, um, a property people want to navigate around. Some people want to navigate around. And in another way, there's some people who have taken some real advantage of it. So um, the, I just put a link in the chat there to a, just an image of some badges that we, we make. Um, so these badges, and what the image you should see is um, a bunch of triangles with lightning bolts in them. Um, so we started screen printing badges, uh, essentially to get around this problem, um, and you know certainly get in touch because if you got if anybody wants badges, we love sending these out to people. Um, the reason we did this is because we realized that if we essentially pre-printed the circuit which is what's been done here, that all a kid has to do is poke a couple holes, put an LED and a battery through, and, and then use the pen as a glue or as a cold solder. And these will, you go from disassembled to um, lit up in usually about five minutes. To, well, I, maybe that's a bit ambitious, depending on the age of the kid, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and so these kind of got around the problem by making the most most of the circuit already uh, already present so they're quite cool um, so is, will the will the um, will the basic paint act actually screen print I mean so can buy yep. the paint and screen print with it yeah no definitely um, in fact that the, the postcard project that I just kind of rushed through there we gave them I think I can't remember how much it was but you know we donated uh, like a Oh, I don't know, like five liters or something, some a lot of paint, um, and they screen printed tons and tons and tons. And in fact, uh, we recently did a project using the largest screens available in the UK, which are two meters long and one and a half meters wide. So it definitely screen prints very, very well. Um, okay, um, have, you, have they have they they tried block printing? Um, oh yeah, so I saw that about block printing. Um, you know, block printing is hard in that you, uh, okay, screen printing is good because you essentially are uh, dumping the, the material onto the substrate. Right. Block printing is more difficult because you're squishing it, um, yeah. and and when you squish it, we find that sometimes it uh, impacts the dispersion. So when we make the material, we try really hard to distribute the conductive particulate as evenly as possible throughout the material. And if you block print it, you squish it, and it can create inconsistent material performance. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's worth playing with. I think basically, this isn't very technical, but uh, if you're not overly aggressive with your block printing, like you don't push it really hard onto the paper, uh, you, it, it, you probably will be successful. Um, but we find it doesn't work with a stamp, for example, because it, yeah, it, it just doesn't seem to work very well. Okay. Um, yeah. I just thought I'd very quickly mention one other project, which I just put in the chat. This this is a person who's really taken advantage of its liquid form. Um, so this is a designer in the UK who realized that because the paint is water-based, it won't mix with oil. So what he did was he made these be these beautiful, beautiful glass bulbs, filled them with, well, partially filled them with baby oil, and then put our paint in the bottom of it. So what you have is a kind of lava lamp looking thing with this big sphere of black paint that, that doesn't want to mix. Um, 
and then he put a light bulb on top and runs 240 volts through the liquid paint. Uh, this is not something that we suggest that anybody try uh, without uh, the appropriate experience because obviously it's quite a dangerous thing, but I will admit that they are incredibly seductive objects, um, especially because as you rotate them, that, that sphere of paint moves and the way that the light fades on and off is absolutely incredible. Um, so do, you have a, do you have any uh, pics or, or videos of that that you can? Well, make? yeah. So I've got. I dropped the the pictures into the. Um, it's oil cooled exactly. I dropped pictures into the the chat there, but we don't. I I literally don't have any video from Patrick, um, and it drives us nuts that we don't have that. So. All I can say is keep looking because we're always trying to get it out of him. Um, so um, would this serve as a substitute for uh, conductive thread on fabric? Can can you use it uh, on on wearables? Um, so it certainly can serve as uh, yeah. Well, yes and no. Um, so it doesn't have the robustness that conductive thread has. Just like it doesn't always serve as a replacement for a wire. Um, you know, you can pull pretty hard on conductive thread before it breaks, but if you print this onto a piece of cotton and you really yank on the, the shirt, uh, you get a lot of fracturing, right? So, so then you have a broken circuit. Um, so in that sense, you know, it, it's not a direct replacement, but what it can do is it can create graphics. Um, and that is something that I think is only beginning to be exploited. The idea that the paint doesn't just allow you to draw a circuit, it allows you to make uh, graphical elements, and I think the badges are a hint at that. Um, you know, I think, in a way, the, the, the pens that we, that we have uh, encourage people to draw lines, when actually what, frankly, is most interesting with the paint is not drawing the line, it's, it's filling areas and creating interactivity in an area. Um, Really practically speaking, though, it's a very good way to terminate conductive thread onto a, uh, like an Arduino, um, like a lily pad Arduino, rather, right? Like, because conductive thread can fray really badly when you try to terminate it. So it works great as a glue for that. Have you seen the David Hockney uh, exhibit that's uh, circulating these days? Uh, no, I have not, but I should, as he is actually a... Um, a, a alumni of our of our school. Um, oh, you should get yeah. some of this into his hands. Definitely, He's, mm. he does some great uh, iPad and iPhone drawings um, that, of course, you can replay the whole uh, painting. And yeah, in the museum, they've got monitors that show the painting from from the beginning. Uh, so he's been experimenting a lot with new technologies, and I, I wonder whether this would be one that would interest him. Mm. Well, you know, actually, let me find, um, we recently did a, uh, we recently did an exhibition in Vienna um, with two friends of ours. Actually, it was, there were, there were many reasons for doing this, um, but one of them was we really wanted to, so I've just put a link in the chat there. Um, <clears throat> We wanted to explore this idea of the material as a, as a really large interface. And the reason I bring this up is that we have a kind of continual association with fine arts, and we think that they, that working with artists is really, um, provides, a, a, I guess, a critical eye towards the, the material and the technology that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and we think it's really important. This is, uh, this is an exhibition where as I mentioned before, we screen printed on this absolutely gigantic screen. So if you scroll part way down the page, you can see this huge, huge screen. Um, it was 30, well, I should say three Tyvek sheets. For those who don't know, Tyvek is a paper fabric. It's really neat. It's what FedEx envelopes are made out of. Um, and each sheet had 10 sensors and a touch board attached to it. And, it, and in the end, you have this kind of, uh, this, this giant, fabric interface that you can walk through and control a soundscape. It was a 
a, a pretty amazing thing, and we've gotten some really good feedback, and I, I do hope that we get more fine artists who want to use the material and uh, see how it can, you know, how it can play a role in their work. Other questions for Matt? Come on, I'm easy. I'll answer anything. Yes, yeah, so I'm. I'm interested in the interface to your capacitive um, control yeah. board. That is, is it? Is it just switches, or are you giving a you know a a value so that it can be used? Like a like, could I make a theremin with it, for instance? Yes. Okay. So yeah, no, that's um, yeah. So the story of the touch board is that we were initially using the Arduino, and the Arduino can work really well to make a couple of capacitive. Uh, pads, but the issue becomes calibrating them, especially if they're environmental changes, right? So if the humidity changes, then the values go all over the place. Um, so we use a specific capacitive touch chip uh, that's essentially being controlled by the Atmel chip of the Arduino. So um, for Arduino novices, that's, it shouldn't sound scary. It's actually really easy to use. It's essentially an Arduino that has a very powerful friend um, that is sitting sitting right next to right next to him, and um, what the chip does is it tries to establish a, a capacitive baseline and thresholds. But to answer your question, you can, if you so choose, get a raw stream of data out of it that is pretty amazing, um, because you can essentially turn anything conductive into a proximity sensor. the The biggest distance that we've got gotten from it is uh, probably about 40 centimeters, maybe 45 centimeters. So if I hover my hand over a, a specifically shaped pad of our paint, um, you know, it's like almost two feet away, the, the touch board can detect if I'm there. If I get closer to it, I get this really nice increase in value, and I can see it happen. So yeah, you could make that a theremin. You could make it a uh, volume control for your stereo. Um, yeah, it's a very easy thing to work with. So the theremin normally has, um, I think, kind of a, a circular antenna and a straight-up antenna, and you use one for pitch and, and one for volume. Could yeah. you make an object and paint those antennae onto that object? Definitely, definitely. I mean, you could literally... Um, so the, the board has 12, uh, 12 electrodes, and you could... Um, you could assign pitch to one, volume to another. Uh, who knows? Maybe you had different samples you wanted to uh, to reference. You know, each. And then you could assign samples to another one and make it, I don't know, make an on-off switch. Um, so certainly you could replicate that. And we actually, you know, I'll be honest that we didn't anticipate the interest from musicians because um, we ran the Touchboard as a Kickstarter project. It's recently completed. Um, we got so much interest from musicians who are clearly interested in exploring new ways of creating music, physically new ways of creating music and, and interfacing with the software that they use. And so I, I suspect that once we start sending out boards, we'll see a huge variety of weird stuff come out. I, I aspire to making a theremin. It's a, uh, there are theremin kits and theremin instructions, and they're on my to-do list, so I guess once I master that, yeah, I need to figure out how to go from there to uh, to using bare conductive. So, are, do you have tutorials and instructables? Yeah. So we yeah we have a lot of instructables up. We also host um, we've got some tutorials directly on the site, which I'll drop a URL in here, um, and um, <clears throat> and so yeah we. You know, what we always want to do is kind of provide the, the baseline technique, right? So here's how you screen print with it. Here's how, um, you know, here's how you can use it to glue something. And, and then what we want to do is, is have people take those tools and turn them into, uh, turn them into their own projects. And I, yeah, I was just going to say quickly, I, like, uh, I think we were surprised and are, well, are continually surprised by how teachers have done that, how teachers have 
um, taken the material and applied it to their own curriculum. So one of the things we, we, we do lots and lots of workshops with schools, um, but mainly because teachers show us this is a really interesting and widely engaging way to play with electronics. Um, so, yeah, it always surprises us the directions it goes. Michelle, we've, we've heard from Ken, who's, who's the old school hacker who's got a uh, makerspace, and you teach relatively young children. You got questions for, for Matt or ideas for what, what you when might be able to do? Yeah, I'm mostly lurking, but when you were talking about doing workshops with teachers, what, um, hmm. what age range have you, like what yeah. age range is your product being applied to? Um, so we've got, boy, it's, uh, it's big. Um, I think the, the youngest workshop we've ever done was a workshop in Budapest uh, a year ago with like four and five year olds and we made badges. I know it's really surprising but actually I think that kids at that age have um, a real ability to focus, you know. They are really focused on the task and um, they, they all made badges successfully, and they had so much fun, uh, which is cool. Um, you know, we I think our kind of sweet spot is normally about, um, I would say, 9 to 13. That's really where we run, end up running a lot of workshops, but that's also a result of when electronics are brought into the UK curriculum. Um, but we have done uh, a few older workshops as well, uh, you know, with 16 and 17-year-olds, and surprising for me, there was a day we made 80 houses with 17-year-old uh, boys, and I was, uh, I never understood this idea of being intimidated by a class of teenagers until I had to go and stand in front of all of those guys, and that is, that was really intimidating, and I suddenly felt really uncool, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, they, they did a really great job, and, and they were really engaged with it, even though I was worried that they might see it as a somewhat trivial thing to make a tiny paper house that lights up. Um, but no, actually, they, they loved it. Um, yeah. Michelle, and if there's any possibility of doing a workshop with one of your classes, maybe we could try to arrange that. Yeah, get certainly. Some, get some bare conductive to your students and yeah, do, a, I certainly do a geek like, out. Yeah, that would be good. I think that it would be a good... Um, it might be easier than sewing. Like needles and thread, uh, the stuff I've been playing with with Sew Electric is neat, but like, um, you know, to thread 22 needles, like that really requires a lot of fine <laughs> skill. And then not to mention that you have a needle. And that's like, kids have a hard time with like the under over. Like that, the under over of sewing requires actually oh, like a fair amount of spatial sense, <laughs> which I mean doesn't bode well for the rest of the electronics, but that. That that like I don't know if I could skip that part. That could be a really good place to start with uh, with the paint. Mm. Well, well, what would what would be the the most fundamental parts list for having second, third, fourth grade students doing a a, a workshop? So you know it depends. Uh, it certainly depends on the time allotted. Um, you know it's it's just you know how much time do you have because what are, and what are we trying to accomplish? Um, the most fundamental would probably be the badges, and we, you know, we love sending badges out because, um, you know, here I'll do it in text as well. I would say like badges, LEDs, batteries, um, and badge pins. The little, um, the little pins you can stick it on your shirt or whatever. Um, you mean like little coin batteries? Um, so we have little, yeah, essentially coin batteries, but we have very special coin batteries that have tiny legs on them, which make them, you know, to be specific, they're through-hole mount coin cells, which means that if we're going to sit down with some kids, I would say to everybody, okay, get your badge, and let's look at it, and let's kind of orient ourselves to it, and then we poke some holes, and then we put our LEDs through, and we pay a lot of attention to which is the long leg and which is the short leg, and then we do the same with the battery, you know, which is the leg that hangs over the side and which is the leg that is shorter. And then we use our pen to just make a little dot on each one, attach your little pin, and that's it. Um, 
you know, we actually the really successful workshops like that, the kids start teaching the other kids, which is great, because then you get a little bit of a um, momentum, and you can just stand on the side of the room. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah. it sounds like you could do that for a few dollars per student. Yeah. Well, we actually we have a we have a classroom specific card kit. And we try to keep that. In, in the UK, the kind of key metric seems to be two pounds per student or less. So that's about, well, about four bucks, 370, something like that. Um, so all of our stuff, yeah, in the US, is, we try to keep it uh, less than that. So usually it works out to about $3 a student or less. Um, I'm always trying to instigate uh, Michelle to do stuff. Uh, <laughs> You you asked for it, Michelle, by by saying that you're hacking your classroom. But uh, let's talk. Maybe we could organize a geek out with Matt around making badges. Yeah. That sounds awesome. I'm I'm all for that. That is excellent instigating, Howard. And if Matt, if you're up for that, <laughs> I, would, I will yeah, put yeah. my order in and organize the time. Because I think I've been really looking for I you know a starting point, and and it's tricky. Like, was it Lego Mindstorms? No, too crazy. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, you know, now I'm like sewing. Oh, actually, pins, perfect. Yeah. And then they can wear yeah. them. Like, it has a place it can go. Like, totally. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, I think that I've I've found like the thing I most want to start on. So. Yeah, well, no, I'm happy to. I mean, we're ha look. I'm happy to help with that. I put my email. It's just Matt at Bear Conductive, so you can email me. And obviously, Howard's got it too. And um, I, I think Ken was asking about drying time, and um, the badges had an unintentional consequence, which is that um, when I have a kid make a badge, I say, "Oh, great, yeah, that looks great. It'll take a minute for it to dry." And then they put it on there. I say, yeah, put it on your shirt or put it on your jacket or your whatever. And um, they put it on there, and they usually forget about it for I don't know, a couple minutes. And the key is they don't blow on it because a lot of people will sit there and, and blow and blow and blow and try and dry it out. But it doesn't. Uh, it actually just makes it wet because your breath is humid. Um, and so by wearing it on your shirt and walking around the room, Inevitably, after like two or three minutes, the kids go, "Wow, wow, mine's working, mine's working!" And then there's this big commotion, you know. That is like a gifted teacher move, right there. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I know, but we didn't anticipate that at all. Because yeah, the exactly. moment you say "Don't touch it," they're like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, they want to squish it." Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I, I've seen some um, some stuff about making speakers out of paper. Yeah, amazing um, stuff. So um, you can tell I'm I'm really a, a, an electronics novice. What else would you need to make a piece of paper talk to you? I guess you need some kind of amplifier. Yeah, yeah I mean I think that you know the the paper obviously to to make a speaker you got to have it something needs to move right um, something needs to vibrate and so. There have been, especially recently, there were some really beautiful prototypes, um, prototype speakers that were made by, uh, I think just with piezo elements, just contracting the paper really slightly, essentially printing these piezo elements. Um, and it, I think that, in theory, you don't actually need very much. It's just that they're still really, really expensive uh, because the manufacturing really isn't there to do it yet. Um, and I think though the poster that I was showing is really exciting, uh, the idea of an interactive poster and interactive books, um, it, you know, frankly, it feels weird to have this big circuit board attached to it. So I think we're still a bit away from where that is as, frankly, like as sexy as it can be in terms of an object. Hmm. But not that far away, probably. No, not no, no, probably not that far. Well, it's just you know, it's a, uh, it's always just a cost issue. You know, it it can exist. It's just uh, there's not very many of them around yet. So besides the touchpad and the ink, mm. what what do you have in store? What are you dreaming of? Well, I mean, I think that the question is where. Um, though I love talking about, like talking with Ken about how how. Uh, how, how, how do we get the signal, or, or what's the kind of format of the signal coming out of the touch board? And, you know, I love talking about the technical details of what we do. Um, what we're w much, much more interested in is the output and the result of the technology rather than the, the gears. And so 
I think that especially this next year for us is really exploring, exploiting the tool set that we have. Um, the touchboard allows us to make things that we've been dreaming about for a really long time. In our studio, our light switches are painted on the wall, right? Um, it's an interaction that people really love. You touch the wall and the light turns on. Very, very cool. Uh, really easy to do now. And the point is, now that it's so easy to do, we can start to say, is it really a good idea? Do people really think it's cool? Um, is it really worth investing in? And uh, I think that for us, the, the burden of our work now is going to be in turning those into th turning that into something we can share. So practically speaking, that could mean like a light switch kit, right? So you know, so I can say to Howard, oh, you know, if you really just want a light switch, take this, put it in your house, do this thing, and then suddenly you've got a light switch. Um, and more sophisticated than that, you know, as the as Howard said in the intro, we're interested in doing really unexpected interactions, and we've got lots of prototypes that start to play with that idea of um, electronics where people don't see them yet. I, I love the the business model that you see with Adafruit and, and Sparkfront. Mm. Um, they give away really great instruction yeah. and sell you the little parts. And the little yeah. parts are kind of cheap, but then yeah. it becomes a habit and <laughs> um, habit, yeah. you're, you're seeing these packages arrive every day and each one of them only costs about five bucks, but uh, yeah. after a while it adds up. So, uh, you know, I love that. Mm. And, and I think kids, kids love that too because you can afford it. Totally. I mean, that, that's, uh, I think, you know, we, in some senses, we're a really traditional startup. Um, and, you know, in, in we have lots of interaction with a kind of London small business community, you could say. And to me, that model is really comfortable for us, right? I'm going to, we make this thing. I, know, I think it has value, and I hope you think it has value. And I'm going to tell you everything about it. And, you're going to get so excited. I know you're going to buy it and play with it, and then um, you're going to help us think of the next best thing to do. And um, that isn't something that sits comfortable with everybody. And, uh, and we, we're kind of always surprised to run into somebody who still doesn't understand that this model can work really well. And, and the size of SparkFun and Adafruit proves that it does work really well. Ken's got a question for you in the chat. Um, yeah, I saw that. Um, I was gonna actually, I was gonna respond to that. It is not. I assume you're talking about the one on the cover of the book, Ken. Um, so yeah, no, it's yeah, it's on the yeah. cover, and it's great. I got I got the book, and I put an yeah, LED in one part of the cover and a battery on totally. the other, and the LED lit up. So no, I know it. It is totally cool. We've got we're actually we are in the book in a couple of places, which right. is very flattering. Um, but it's not our ink on the cover, and well, I should say paint. I, I wish that it was, and frankly, the reason that it isn't is that ours is probably not robust enough to survive the rigors of uh, however many thousands or hundreds of thousands, who knows, of books are going to be going and, and you know, living in all of these places. Because um, as I'm sure you've experienced, you know, it doesn't have a lot of rub fastness once it's dry. We're, we're talking about The Art of Tinkering by Karen Wilkinson. Uh, yeah. Mm. For our in the chat. Yeah. And, and, you know, I should say the, the Art of Tinkering was done, I think, in collaboration with or by the Tinkering Studio at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was just such a fantastic museum. I just love the Exploratorium. It's amazing. Have you been to the new one? Yeah, I have. We went in um, right before Maker Faire... Uh, in Bay Area last year. We went to the new one. We have a friend who works in the shop, and so we got a tour, and it's just incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I think, without a doubt, the most incredible thing they have is, and for those of you who have, haven't been to the Exploratorium, you should uh, go immediately. Um, we saw the giant NASA, or the, gi the giant mirror. I think they just call it a giant mirror. And it was apparently from a flight simulator at NASA, and it's, um, I don't know, like 15, 20 feet wide and 15 feet tall. And it's concave, and it, it has this incredible optical illusion where you essentially 
feel like you're walking through a reflection of yourself as you walk up to it. It is like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. And it was just a gaggle of kids all screaming and running around as they were trying to understand what was going on. Amazing place. They also have uh, the giant zoetrope. I don't know whether you yeah. saw that. Amazing. Totally. <laughs> I mean, I could go on for hours about all the weird stuff there, but I think they, it, you know, it's, it, the reason I like it so much is it typifies the way we, that we think about learning and experimenting at, at work, you know, playing with things, getting our hands really dirty and watching all the weird stuff come out of it and then finding value in all those things. You know, you need to get permission, but I think it would be wonderful to see some video of the kids uh, making stuff and teaching each other uh, yeah. things. It would just, uh, I think there are the maker parents, but then mm. there's a, a lot of parents and educators who sort of, they kind of need to see it in action to, to yeah. understand that we're in a new era in terms of mm. learning how to do these technologies. Well, I think that that's... Um, you know, everybody does benefit from a model, totally. I mean, I think that that, um, that, that uh, you know, is really evident at Maker Faire. So we, we typically, every year, we go to Maker Faire Bay Area uh, just because it's so big and um, it's a great way for us to reach out. And uh, what we've seen over the last few years is that more and more, I think skeptical is too harsh of a word, but it feels kind of appropriate, more skeptical parents arrive with their kids and seem kind of surprised at how engaged the kids are uh, into what they in, into everything there, um, and they quickly become converts. And you know, there's just yeah, there's this kind of like uh, cynicism about uh, screen-based learning. I think that we we meet parents who have real cynicism about that. But what they don't realize is that actually a lot of times those screens are an avenue to something else is, that is physical. Um, and when you get to Maker Faire, all these physical manifestations of Minecraft that kids are into, it's incredible. Well, you know, one of the things that, um, that I do and that's uh, connected to these geek outs is uh, talk about connected learning. And so the mm. idea about connected learning is that it's interest-based. It starts yeah. with doing something that really interests you, but it's also networked. So the, the the technology is not so much the you will play an instructable and learn how to do it as more and more people are teaching each other how to do these things using mm -hmm. Hangouts and, and other media. Um, yeah. And then it's, it, it's peer-based and that there's a, yeah. you know, once you kind of get the ball rolling, it certainly helps to have a a teacher, a facilitator, a model, but then, um, you know, I think one of the most important skills to learn as a teacher is when to shut up and let the kids teach each other. And totally. with this stuff, they they take to it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the hardest thing, um, you know, for us, well, I can't speak for all of us, but for me, um, is oftentimes when we have, well, like a hack day, we did a, a recently did a hack day with the touchboard. Um, you know, it was with adults, so uh, I, I certainly wouldn't call myself teacher in that context. But, you know, in a way, I, I know a lot more about the touchboard than a lot of the participants do. And you're exactly right that you have to figure out when to stop, when, um, when to stop directing a bit and in introducing. And uh, it's, it's tough because I think, oh, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, man, I don't know if that's going to work or... You know, I can kind of, see, I, I think I can see a few steps ahead because I think, oh, I've tried that before. But um, actually, that's a, a really dangerous game to play. And the best thing is to say, here's what it does. Here's how generally how it works. Have fun. And then only, only participate if somebody is really struggling or has a question. Um, and the outputs can be really unexpected. I think uh, speaking like really practically about that, one of the really interesting outputs was uh, this is seems somewhat technical, but it's uh, it's quite a clever idea, which is that usually we think of the touchboard as um, being attached to a wall, and you paint a line from it, or you connect a wire to it, and then you touch the wire, or you touch the light switch, and the touchboard then says, "Oh, you know, someone's touched me, so I'm going to make a noise." 
right? Um, or drive in another event. So this person said, can you have an object which is not a person or an animal set off that switch? So he put a remote control car inside of a chip bag, like a foil chip bag, and then made a giant pad of paint. And when you drive the remote control car over it, it has enough capacitance to set off the switch, right? And so in our mind, the rolling assumption was the only way to touch the switch was by touching it with your hand or with your face or standing on top of it. But actually, he was doing it by a third party, uh, which is this little robot, which, you know, it, I'm really glad I didn't say anything and I just let that happen because that is, opens up a whole new area. You know, now robots can play with our stuff too. So we're coming up on the top of the hour, and I want to give uh, you all the opportunity to ask anything you want before we adjourn for the day. Yeah, I have no more uh, questions, but thanks, Matt. That was wonderful. I learned. I really learned a lot about the material and the other stuff you're doing, and I can't wait to go and use it. Well, you know, Ken, I hope you saw my email address in the um, in the the chat. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out on email. It's just, it's easy. It's just Matt at bearconductive.com. And, and, you know, Paul and Michelle, you too, because, you know. And I will be talking with, uh, with Ken and with Michelle about maybe setting up something with kids to do another geek out, but one in which Great. we have a few weeks in advance for them to get the materials together and actually cool. put it together. Yeah, no, that would be great. And actually, I should say that we, as part of our Kickstarter, um, we we promised all of our, our very loyal backers that we'd run what we're calling a global hack day. And we haven't decided a date yet or released any, any hard details, but it's most likely going to be in May. Um, and that's where we're trying to get as many hacker spaces, teachers, I don't know, people sitting in their basement as possible to all play on the same day. Um, who knows what this will become. Uh, it has big ambitions and it could lead to a big crash, but we like the, we like the sense of danger that comes with that. Um, so keep in touch about that too because it's, you know, I, I, sounds like you guys might be a great group to reach out to. We'll be happy to help spread the word. And, and also just uh, to, to let you know what's going on here, um, these Geek Outs are a non-profit. Uh, We're sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation, and the idea is to, to create a platform and a medium for peer learning. So you don't need me to create one. Sure. Uh, they stream, they're recorded, and uh, if, if you need help setting one up, let me know. But otherwise, if you join um, Homago, you mm. can create your own Geek Out at, at any time, and the people who have joined to follow Arduino will automatically get a notice and, and sign up for okay. it. Okay. Automatically get the email when it's time to, to join. So uh, I'd, I'd love to see you guys uh, using the, the, the platform. Cool. All right. At that, I will bid you goodbye. This has been great. I will um, tweet and Facebook the... the uh, URL when the YouTube becomes available in probably about an hour. And, great. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. This was great, oh. and we will be in touch. Yeah, thank you guys. It's a lot of fun.